For most of us, just the thought of being trapped inside a submarine, it's downright terrifying. And yeah, it's really not hard to see why. All those classic nightmares just flood your mind instantly. Claustrophobia is probably the first thing that jumps out, right? I mean, picture this. Inside a submarine, it's unbelievably cramped. Everything's just tight. It's like being sealed in this giant metal tube with absolutely zero way out. Once you're in, you are in. There's no exit door until that boat hits the surface. It's got to feel like being swallowed whole by some kind of steel beast. All right, so maybe tiny spaces don't freak you out. But what about that never-ending darkness, that bone-deep silence of the deep sea? The ocean out there, it's the true definition of a void. Now, I've never been there myself, but man, even just looking at pictures of sailors outside a sub in the deep, it sends shivers down my spine. There's just nothing. Nothing above, nothing to the sides, nothing below. Just this enormous, cold, dark blue emptiness that feels like it's pressing down on you. You're completely isolated, totally cut off from the rest of the world, with all that water, tons and tons of it, just waiting to bear down from every angle. Thinking about being deep underwater in a sub, it's probably like imagining the most desolate, isolated spot on the planet. Only then multiply that by 10 on the scary scale. You're surrounded by this insane water pressure, and the deeper you dive, the heavier that pressure gets. That awful feeling, it doesn't just sneak up, it hits you hard. You're basically moving around in a war machine that could turn into your iron coffin at any given second. And there's not a damn thing you or anyone else can do if Mother Nature decides it's your time. Water, it's a relentless force. The second you're submerged, that pressure is all over you. Every few feet you go down, it just ramps up like crazy. In the end, the water will crush you as easily as a giant boulder would pulverize anything in its path. We're not just talking about drowning here. This is about being physically obliterated by the raw, brutal power of nature. Submarines, these incredible pieces of engineering, they're obviously built with some serious math to handle this kind of insane water pressure. We've actually sent specialized research subs to the deepest spot in the ocean, the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. That's nearly seven miles down, or about 36,000 feet. But military submarines, the kind we're talking about, they're a whole different ballgame. An attack sub's safe operating depth? It's only around a third of a mile, something like 1,600 to 1,700 feet. The exact numbers, of course, are top secret, but that's the general idea. And even that's being optimistic. That test depth, that's the official safe diving limit. They can go deeper, sure, but then you're heading straight into the danger zone. There's this term, crush depth. That's basically how far down the hull can go before it just gives up, buckles and implodes like a soda can someone stomped on. Usually, this crush depth is about one and a half, maybe two times its test depth. So, if that test depth is, say, 1,650 feet, around 500 meters, its crush depth could be anywhere from 2,500 to 3,300 feet, roughly 750 to 1,000 meters. Still, that's nowhere near the bottom of the really deep ocean. Once a sub passes its crush depth, it's game over. The hull will warp, then shatter, and the ocean will come roaring in, wiping out everything in a blink. Back in the Cold War, a number of nuclear subs became the silent victims of the superpower standoff, vanishing with everyone on board. One of the most gut-wrenching stories is the USS Thresher SSN-593. She was the first U.S. nuclear sub ever lost at sea. Commissioned in 61, the Thresher was a state-of-the-art fast-attack nuclear boat, the peak of Navy tech back then. Being the first of her class, she went through a ton of tough testing. But after a nine-month overhaul that wrapped up in early 63, a dark fate was waiting for her. Morning of April 9, 1963, the Thresher sails from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She's headed off the coast of Cape Cod for deep diving tests after her refit, with a rescue ship, the USS Skylark ASR-20, tagging along. After a few successful shallow dives on April 10, around 7.47 a.m., Thresher starts her dive to full test depth. That's about 1,000 feet, or 300 meters. Everything's reported normal. 
At 9.13 a.m., Thresher radios in. She's at test depth. But just minutes later, the Skylark gets a garbled, worrying message. Experiencing minor difficulties. Have positive up angle. Attempting to blow. That's the call for an emergency surface. Then, the line went dead. Two minutes later, around 9.17 a.m., the Skylark picks up a strange, muffled sound. The only words they could make out were test depth, exceeding, followed by this deep, low-frequency rumble, the kind of sound a hull makes when it's caving in under massive pressure. After that, just silence. The USS Thresher, SSN-593, with all 129 souls aboard, including her commander, Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, was gone. Later analysis pointed to some major design flaws. The leading theory? A high-pressure seawater pipe in the engine room burst, probably at a joint sealed with silver brazing. That blast of seawater likely fried the electrical panels, causing the reactor to scram, shut down, and they lost all propulsion. When they tried to blow the main ballast tanks to surface, it failed. The super-pressurized air, expanding too fast, actually caused moisture in the valves to freeze solid, clogging them up. A second try didn't work either. The thresher just kept sinking, uncontrolled, way past her operational limits. And finally, she disintegrated somewhere between 1,300 and 2,000 feet down. It was a horrific accident, one of the worst in submarine history, and it forced huge changes in U.S. submarine safety. The Nightmare Returns, the tragedy of KRI Nangala, 402. The Thresher's tragic story isn't a one-off, sadly. It's a stark reminder of just how dangerous the deep ocean is. Decades after the Thresher was lost, that same nightmare played out again, this time for Indonesia. On April 21st, 2021, news broke that stunned Indonesia and the world. KRI Nangala, 402 a German-built Type 209 submarine that had served for decades, was missing. She was out on a torpedo drill in the waters north of Bali, carrying 53 crewmen, including Colonel Harry Setiawan, the head of the fleet submarine unit. The Nangala asked for permission to dive around 3 a.m. local time for the exercise, but then, around 4.25 a.m., contact was just lost. The last signal picked up showed the sub was getting ready to fire a practice torpedo. After that, silence. Panic set in immediately. A huge search kicked off with Indonesian Navy ships, the National Search and Rescue Agency, and help from other countries, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, the US, India. An entire nation just held its breath, praying for good news. But that hope started to crumble when, a few days later, they began finding debris that looked like it came from the KRI Nangala 402. Parts of a torpedo tube, insulation from cooling pipes, a grease bottle for the periscope, and then the most heartbreaking find, prayer mats belonging to the crew. On April 25, 2021, Indonesia's military chief, Air Chief Marshal Hadi Chajanto, had to make the devastating announcement, KRI Nangala 402 was officially subsunk, sunk, and all 53 crew members had died as heroes of the nation. The sub was found in three pieces, nearly 2,800 feet down, about 838 meters. That's way, way beyond its crush depth, which was estimated around 1,600 feet, or 500 meters. At that kind of depth, the water pressure is more than 80 times what it is at the surface. No submarine is built to take that. The exact cause of KRI Nangala 402's sinking is still being looked into. But the strongest theory points to a complete electrical blackout while the sub was submerged. If that happened, they would have lost all control over their depth and wouldn't have been able to do any emergency surfacing procedures, like blowing the ballast tanks. Without power, the Nangala was just helpless, pulled down by gravity and that relentless ocean pressure into the abyss. Losing the KRI Nangala 402 was a deep, deep wound for Indonesia. 53 of the nation's best sailors lost on duty, now on eternal patrol in the Bali Strait. This tragedy just hammered home once again the incredible risks these submariners face, these knights of the deep, working in one of the most extreme, unforgiving places on Earth. The final moments. An unthinkable end. 
So what's it actually like inside a sub when the hull gives way and it implodes from the pressure? Well, it's tough to say for certain because, let's be honest, no one's ever gone through it and lived to tell the story. But we can paint a pretty terrifying picture. Before the actual implosion, the crew, they'd know something was going catastrophically wrong, especially as they kept sinking past those safety limits. You'd imagine lights flickering, instruments going haywire, showing numbers that would make your heart pound. The hull itself would probably start making these awful noises, groaning sounds, like metal screaming under stress, these sickening creaks as welds start to pop. I mean, that's a sound that would go right through you, the sound of death itself getting closer. That cold, deep sea water might start seeping in through tiny cracks, just adding to the sheer horror of it all. But once that critical point is breached, when the hull finally fails, it all happens unbelievably fast. We're talking less than a second. An implosion is violent, and it's instant. The second that steel hull surrenders, seawater, under hundreds of times normal atmospheric pressure, slams into the sub at something like the speed of sound. The air pressure inside the sub, which was normal just a moment before, would spike astronomically in a tiny fraction of a second. The air itself gets compressed so violently, so quickly, that its temperature shoots up to thousands of degrees, kind of like what happens in a diesel engine cylinder. It gets hot enough to instantly ignite anything flammable. We're talking flash fires, incinerating bodies, and then there's the shockwave, this colossal blast of energy, like a bomb going off inside. Anyone caught in that would be obliterated. Think about it. Even if, by some miracle, you survived that initial violent rush of water, the pressure alone would instantly crush every air-filled space in your body. Your lungs would collapse. Eardrums would burst. Internal organs pulped. And don't forget the shrapnel. Pieces of the sub itself. Now deadly projectiles flying everywhere. And then, of course, just the sheer volume of water. Tons of it, blasting in with unimaginable force, scouring everything out. Basically, you'd be killed many times over, in the most extreme ways imaginable, all happening almost at the same time. It sounds beyond horrific. But the only mercy, if you can even use that word, is that it all likely happens much, much faster than your brain could ever process. So, the crew, they probably died before they could even fully register what was happening right at that moment of implosion. But make no mistake, they would have endured absolute unimaginable terror as their vessel plunged, slowly but surely, towards its doom, before that final, catastrophic moment. Those would have been the longest, most horrifying minutes of their lives.